Hey folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and yeah, uh, it seems like so many other people out there are, well, the Gizmodo article, which we'll talk about here in a second, seems to be the big one, saw what I've basically been saying and had said in my previous Open D&D uh, OGL situation video that, yeah, it's bad. It's actually, in my mind, I actually think worse than what I had originally said in my first video, uh, because... Well, we've seen what it is, or at least what it's supposed to be. Now, I didn't want to make this video at this point because we haven't seen anything official from Wizards of the Coast yet, which could be a good thing. So I want to come out and say that. So what was leaked and what's referenced in that article is basically everything that I had seen that was also leaked OGL stuff uh, that shows a lot of the really awful things, but it's basically blown up all over Twitter. Everybody's talking about it. So I was like, well, it's as good a time as any to make a video on it. Um, I also, I'm not going to come out and go, and uh, I told you so or anything like that, uh, because I really had sincerely hoped that while my video was, I guess, alarmist, and according to so many people in the comments calling me a fear monger and just doing it for clicks and likes and all this other kind of stuff, uh, obviously that wasn't the intention, but I was sincerely hoping to be proven wrong and unfortunately, it seems like that's not the case. Now, I will say, once again, to say this up front, take this all with a grain of salt. It, it, it's this information that's going to be discussed here has been verified, in my mind, from multiple sources. But the only one that hasn't officially verified it is Wizards of the Coast, the people who made the ultimate thing. And now... All the NDAs that people had signed about this, I think, expired yesterday on the 4th. And everyone or was expecting a statement from Wizards of the Coast yesterday. Now, we're looking at this potentially as a positive and that maybe all of the blowback and you know, leaks and everything that's going around that people are all upset about, maybe that's given Watsi enough pause for them to say, hey, maybe we don't release this statement and as such, we'll wait and, uh, you know, not do any, we'll, we'll change it maybe. Which, ultimately, if I, like others, and possibly even like this article had come out and said, here's what it looks like, what it's going to be, and then talk about it, and then Watsi releases something tomorrow and says, actually, it's not like that at all, then everybody's going to be like, oh my god, it was all fear, you know, alarmist, fear-mongering nonsense. So that's why I didn't want to make this video now, but considering everybody's talking about it, and honestly, the more buzz that is built around this, the potential of them actually not submitting and going forward with what was originally presented that we're going to talk about here is, you know, maybe that'll give it a little more credence and they'll take a second look at it. So... Uh, I have a couple of articles and different things I want to talk through. So let's go ahead and jump in. This is the main article everyone was talking about. This is from uh, Linda Kodega. It was published about four hours ago as of the time of me recording this. Says, Despite reassurance from Wizards of the Coast last month, which is, again, I made my video and then Wizards of the Coast released their statement that says, no, the OGL is not going away. And then everybody's like, oh, see, you're like, how much more clear could it be? You're being a jerk. And uh, it is what it is. Um will become an unauthorized... The original OGL will become an unauthorized agreement and it appears no new content will be permitted to be created under the original license. So this goes on to talk about what is the original OGL, which is an important thing, right? Um, it's what many contemporary tabletop publishers use to create their products within the boundaries of D&D's uh, re um, reproducible content. Much of the original OGL is dedicated to the system reference document, includes character species, classes, and so on. The creation of the OGL version 1.0, which was originally published in 2000, which is something that we'll talk about because this is probably a lot more far-reaching than you might initially think, was published in 2000, has allowed a host of uh, designers and publishers, both amateur and professional, to make new products for a game that remains entirely owned by Hasbro subsidiary Wizards of the Coast. While well, this arrangement created products that directly compete with uh, Watsi Publications, it also allowed the game to flourish and grow thanks to the resources created by the wider D&D community. In 2022, when Watsi announced plans to develop the revised edition of the rules, codenamed 1D&D, the company said it would update the OGL as well. The OGL has been tweaked multiple times since its 2000 release, and the Watsi has had it uh, 
at times transitioned to other royalty-free licenses, but the original OGL 1.0 had essentially remained intact until the company said it would develop OGL version 1.1. What is the new OGL 1.1? A lot, actually. While the original open gaming license is a relatively short document, coming in at under 900 words, the new draft of the OGL, which was provided to io9 by a non-Watson developer, is over 9,000 words long. It addresses new technologies like blockchain and NFTs and takes a strong stance against bigoted content, explicitly stating the company may terminate the agreement if third-party creators publish materials that is, quote, blatantly racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, bigoted, or otherwise discriminatory, end quote. I believe this is targeted directly at new TSR and all the nonsense that they were doing. I think that's that specific sentence is uh, basically put in just for that. But, we can, I mean, obviously, there's a greater, uh, you know, for anybody, which I totally understand, but I think that's specifically targeted at what new TSR was doing. One of the biggest changes to the document is that it updates the previous available OGL 1.0 to state that it is, quote, no longer an authorized license agreement, end quote. By ending the original OGL, many licensed publishers will have to completely overhaul their products and distribution in order to comply with the updated rules. Large publishers who focus almost exclusively on products based on the original OGL, including Paizo, Cobalt Press, and Green Ronin, will be under pressure to update their business model incredibly fast. This is no mistake. According to the document procured by io9, the new agreement states that, quote, the open game license was always intended to allow the community to help grow D&D and expand it creatively. It wasn't intended to subsidize major competitors, especially now that its PDF is by far the most common form of distribution, end quote. Can we talk about that for a second? The open game license was always intended to allow the community to help grow D&D and expand it creatively. It wasn't intended to subsidize major competitors, i.e. Paizo, i.e. Pathfinder. The point of that is, because the OGL 1.0 was released in 20, or 2000, anybody who's made content using this two-page open game license, basically all you had to do was include the two pages uh, of that in your document somewhere and that basically made you compliant with the open game license. Uh, so the entirety of Pathfinder 1E, I can't speak to 2E, I haven't looked at it, but Pathfinder 1E only exists because of the open game license 1.0. Uh, it was, Wizards of the Coast went from their 3.5, they went to 4th edition, it didn't do very well commercially, and it didn't have, it had basically a license similar to what we're going to talk about here, and Paizo said, well, we're going to take the open game license and make our own version and call it Pathfinder, and because of that, with this new change that they're talking about, this will impact Paizo's ability to produce Pathfinder. If Pathfinder 2E references the open game license at anywhere within it, then it is also subject to this. There are a ton of other systems, and I this is something that maybe you guys can do. I've been talking with friends about this for a while. There are a lot, a lot, more than you probably think, of third-party, not even necessarily D&D creators, just other companies that use the open game license or reference it, like... I'm pretty sure Chaosium for Call of Cthulhu references and has the open game license in their products. Now, it might not be obviously the main focus of Call of Cthulhu, but I do believe that it's referenced. And there are several other RPGs that have been in existence for 20 plus years that reference the open game license and use some of the terminology and things from it as such are now impacted by these changes. Uh, this sentiment is reiterated later in the document. The, quote, OGL wasn't intended to fund major competitors, and it wasn't intended to allow people to make D&D apps, videos, or anything other than printed or printable materials for use while gaming. We are updating the OGL in part to make that very clear, end quote. Basically, they don't want to allow anybody to use the D&D stuff to make apps on your phone or whatever it might be to facilitate, um, you know, whether that be character creation, character sheets, dungeon creators, any of that kind of stuff. That's not acquired. Um, anybody who's using the OGL to make video games, I think Solasta Crown of the Magister would probably be one of the big ones um, for that as well. Paizo Inc., publisher of the Pathfinder RPG, one of D&D's largest competitors, declined to comment on the changes for this article, stating that the rules update was a complicated and ongoing situation. 
Chris Pramus, founder and res uh, president of Green Ronin Publishing, said that despite the fact that one of their own products, Mutants and Masterminds, was published under the original OGL in 2002 and is still available today, they have not seen the updated OGL and they do not believe there is, quote, any benefit to switching to the new one as described, end quote. Again, it is still using the original OGL and potentially this change uh, may invalidate that completely, but we'll keep going. Wizards of the Coast declined to comment for this article uh, or any specific questions about the leaked OGL document. A spokesperson directed io9 to a blog post the company published in December, which reassures the community that the OGL will not materially affect the majority of people working in the industry. Yeah, okay. Uh, what will happen to the original OGL? The original OGL granted perpetual worldwide non-exclusive license to the open game content, commonly called a system reference document, and directed the licensees may use any authorized version of this license to copy, modify, and distribute any open game content originally distributed under the version uh, under any version of this license, end quote. But the updated OGL says that, quote, this agreement is an update to the previously available OGL 1.0, which is no longer an authorized license agreement. The new document clarifies further in the warranty section that this government, uh, the, sorry, that this agreement governs your use of the licensed content, and unless otherwise stated in this agreement, any prior agreements between us and you are no longer in force. According to attorneys consulted for this article, the new language may indicate that Wizards of the Coast is rendering any future use of the original OGL void and asserting that if anyone wants to continue to use open game content of any kind, they will need to be they will need to abide by terms of the updated OGL, which is far more restrictive agreement than the original OGL. Wizards of the Coast declined to clarify if this is in fact the case. That is what my interpretation of what I have seen is as well. Uh, a lot of people were under the impression that we well, just don't sign the new OGL and you can't use any of the new content, but you can continue to use the OGL 1.0a that you've been using for 20 plus years. I believe, based on exactly what uh, the folks here at Gizmodo are saying, it does appear to me to be written in such a way that it's invalidating the previous one, voiding that, and forcing you to sign up for the new one. Who will be affected by the OGL 1.1? If the original license is in fact no longer viable, every single licensed publisher will be affected by the new agreement because every commercial creator will be asked to report their products new and old to Wizards of the Coast. Additionally, while the original OGL did not specifically outline what kind of content you could make uh, and profit from, the updated OGL is very specific. Only allows for creation of role-playing games and supplements in printed media and static electronic file formats. It doesn't allow for anything else, including but not limited to the things like videos, virtual tabletops, or VTT campaigns, computer games, novels, apps, graphic novels, music, songs, dances, and pantomimes. You may engage in these activities only to the extent allowed under the Wizards of the Coast fan content policy or separately agreed to between you and us. That is a quote, by the way, from the, art, from the document itself. The fan content policy can be read here, but in broad strokes it allows for free content, quote, based on or incorporating our IP, Fan content includes fan art, videos, po podcasts, blogs, websites, streaming content, tattoos, altars to your cleric's deity, etc. So that's basically where I fall is more under the fan content policy as far as making videos and things. Well, but this is basically saying it's not going to allow you to write D&D novels. You're not going to be able to make... It specifically lists virtual or computer games, which I'm pretty sure, again, is a shot directly at Slost the Crown of the Magister. Uh, and then also, again, for virtual tabletops and virtual tabletop campaigns. Uh, this is, again, it specifically states static electronic file formats, meaning PDFs. So, again, if you have a website or something that uses the D&D &D things to help as, like, a character creator or something like, I guess, Cobalt Fight Club, things like that, those websites that are dynamic in that they change because they're updated, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, that is not covered under this new version. The leaked OGL 1.1 draft indicates that WASI may not ha give licenses a lot of time to adjust to agree to this new policy. The document reads, if you want to publish SRD-based content on or after January 13th and commercialize it, your only option is to agree to the OGL commercial. io9 source indicated that the final version of the document was originally intended for release on January 4th, which would have given companies and creators seven business days to agree and comply. That is 100% what I saw and what I was what I looked at and received as well was that it was supposed to be sent to people yesterday on the 4th with them having to comply by the 13th of January or you couldn't continue to make content at all. 
What's changing in the new OGL? Uh, it's divided into non-commercial, this is, oh boy, non-commercial and commercial agreements. And the rules are slightly different if you're making money from direct sales or access to your work. The biggest change between the two sections is a tiered earning system, more on that later, new royalties and rules for the use of crowdfunding. There's some clarity given about Patreon and tips. Uh, basically, if your content is available for free elsewhere, but people can support you voluntarily without having their access affected, you are considered a non-commercial. Additionally, all creators will need to clearly and deliberately distinguish, quote, their content from, quote, licensed content. The new document reads that this must be done, quote, in a way that allows a reader of your licensed work to understand the distinction without checking any other document. The updated OGL suggests a different color font, asterisks on the page, or putting a separate index or list in the back of your licensed work that lists out what exactly you used from the SRD. Other parts of the new OGL document create a tiered system of categorizing licenses based on their revenues from commercialized work under the outdated OGL. So you can't even just like previously, again, you could just throw those two pages in the back of your document and then that was it. Now you basically need to say like, if I reference this specific thing, I need to clearly let you know Watsi made this, not me, uh, throughout the entirety of your document, which is just exhaustive and ridiculous in my opinion. Um, Will OGL publishers have to pay royalties? Oh, yes, they will. Prob uh, oh, sorry, publishers, no. Pu probably not, unless they're making over $750,000. Well, nah. licenses get uh, licensees get to keep the money they earn, but the new OGL states that the commercial agreement covers all commercial uses, whether they're profitable or not. So if you go into the red on a Kickstarter that earned 800 k in backing money, you still owe Wizards of the Coast, regardless of the fact that you did not profit from your venture. Note, that if you appear to have achieved great success from producing OGL commercial content, we may reach out to you for a more custom and mutually beneficial licensing agreement. The document notes indicating that Watsi is open to creating custom contracts and agreements, but at their discretion. This could indicate that, quote, subsidized competition like Pathfinder might not get a great deal. The revenue tiers are as follows. Initiate tier. If you have registered at least one licensed work, but haven't generated $50,000 or more in a total gross revenue from the OGL, commercial products in a year, you are at the initiative tier. Intermediate tier. If your licensed works have generated more than $50,000 in total revenue in a given year, but less than $750,000, you are in the intermediate tier. And then again, if it's over $750K, that's the expert tier. According to the document, if and only if you are generating a significant amount of money over 70, uh, $750K per year across all licensed works, uh, the revenue you make from your licensed works in excess of 750000 in a single calendar year is considered qualifying revenue, and you are responsible for paying us 20 or 25% of that qualifying revenue. The draft goes on to explain that if you make $750,001, you will owe Wizards of the Coast 25 cents, as they are only asking for royalties on the dollar made, uh, on the one dollar made in the excess, uh, of the expert tier. As stated in their announcement in December, Watsi suspects that less than twenty per, less than twenty companies are at the expert tier. I'm not sure if that's true, given the fact that basically what we talked about here with Kickstarter. Um, so if you go into the red on a Kickstarter that earned 800k in backing money, you will still owe Wizards of the Coast regardless of the fact you didn't profit. So this is again hitting any Kickstarter that makes that amount of money. Uh, who has to register work? This is another good one. Um, oh, and I should, it might come up later, but basically the uh, the document says that they can change and adjust any aspect of this license at any point in time as they see fit, as long as they give you 30 days notice. So this 750K number could easily start coming down year after year to basically possibly down to that 50,000 level or maybe even less if they wanted to. The updated OGL says that, quote, no matter what tier you are in or how much money you believe your product will make, you must register with us any new licensed work you intend to offer for sale, including a description of the licensed work. We'll also uh, ask for your contact information, information on where you intend to publish the licensed work and its price, among other things. Creators will also be required to use a specific badge in order to publicly and obviously identify their work as covered by the updated OGL, and they have to give Watsi a copy of the publication. The early draft suggests that many of these processes will be handled through the company's official digital toolset, D&D Beyond. This is a significant change from the original OGL, which allowed creators to publish without reporting. 
well, it makes sense that Wizards wants to monitor who is uh, using the open game content. This feels like an impossible task. People are selling their work across dozens of platforms, and sometimes one product is being sold on multiple platforms. Whatever the reporting looks like, the biggest burden will likely be on the smallest creators. Kickstarter is D&D's preferred crowdfunding platform. Online crowdfunding is a new phenomenon since the original OGL was created, and the license attempts to address how and where these fundraising campaigns can take place. The OGL 1.1 states that if creators are members of the expert tier, if your license work is crowdfunded or sold via platform other than Kickstarter, you will pay 25% royalty on qualifying revenue. And if your license work is crowdfunded on Kickstarter, our preferred crowdfunding platform, you will only pay 20% royalty on qualifying revenue. This means that the updated OGL is directly encouraging Kickstarter over any other platform, including private company sites, as any non-Kickstarter revenue over 750k will incur a 25% royalty, and only Kickstarter revenue gets a break. There is no reason stated why Kickstarter's Wizards preferred crowdfunding platform. There is also a section in the updated OGL dedicated to conditions surrounding crowdfunding. Even for initiate and intermediate tiers, there are strings attached to using any crowdfunding platform, not just Kickstarter, to get a project off the ground. The two main points are that, quote, you may only crowdfund the product uh, production of licensed works and that, quote, no infringing materials are given out as perks or rewards. Um, I should also point out that John Ritter, who's kind of the head of games on uh, Kickstarter, put this out and said Kickstarter was contacted after WotC decided to make OGL changes. So we felt the best move was to advocate for creators, which we did manage to get lower percentage plus more being discussed. No hidden benefits slash financial uh, kickbacks for Kickstarter. This is their license, obviously, not ours. So, I mean, again, they actually, they talked them down, which is interesting. <coughs> the power is back at Wizards of the Coast. Well, there's plenty more to parse. The main takeaway from the leaked OGL 1.1 draft is that Wizards of the Coast is keeping power close at hand. There is no mention of perpetual worldwide rights given to creators, which was present in Section 4 of the original OGL. And one of the caveats is the company, here it is, can modify or terminate this agreement for any reason whatsoever, provided we give 30 days notice. Watsi also gets the right to use any content that licensees create, whether commercial or non-commercial. Although this is couched in a language to protect Wizards products from infringing on creators' copyright, the document states that for any content created under the uh, updated OGL, regardless of whether or not it is owned by the creator, Wizards will have a, quote, non-exclusive, perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, sub-licensable, royalty-free license to use that content for any purpose. There are a lot of implications in the extended policy, and the ramifications of this updated OGL could have a chilling effect on new licensed products. As only, quote, static products are included, all work that publishers do for virtual tabletops, may have to be offered as non-commercial free products, which de-incentivizes their production. The royalties associated with any company making above 750k could also prompt publishers to hold back extra products or scale down projects to stay safe under the expert tier. WotC is clearly expecting these OGL changes to be met with some resistance. The document does note that if the company oversteps, they are aware that they, quote, will receive community pushback and bad PR and we're more than open to being convinced that we made a wrong decision, end quote. Uh, they've reached out, IO9's reached out to other folks to get some more information. So that is the document in full, uh, or the article in full, which echoes basically, like I said, everything that I saw. Um, a couple things that weren't referenced in here um, that I thought I would bring up is um, if your contract is like that contract that they can terminate or whatever for any reason. Uh, if your contract is terminated, you are now long, no longer allowed to create any content as far as from what I read. Again, I read it at a point and I haven't seen it in a little while. But basically, yeah, if you had a contract with them and it's terminated, uh, then you basically aren't allowed to create any content at all anymore for 5th edition. Um... I think also agreeing to the open game license uh, uh, forfeits your rights to possibly enter into any class action lawsuits in the future that people may levy against Wizards of the Coast for the purposes of, um, uh, sorry, for the purposes of like loss of revenue or anything like that. Also, the rumor on the street was, remember how folks I had said in my video, you know, there's a whole NDA situation, NDAs are going out. Uh, again, cannot confirm or deny this, but uh, the rumor that I have heard 
is that if you received one of these things originally and then signed the NDA, the benefit you got for signing the NDA is a 15% royalty as opposed to the 20 or 25%. So early adopters got a better deal uh, than the traditional license or the one we're talking about right here. And that very clearly show that it's not really designed for creators. Oh, one thing that wasn't really mentioned in here is that there, you, even if you want to create content for free, you still need to sign a, an agreement. The one that all the ones with all the money and everything we've been talking about is the commercial uh, open game license. There is a non-commercial open game license, which is basically if you want to create free share alike content, which by the way, this article says basically nothing's going to change if you want to create free content. But if you want to create free content and publish it anywhere on the internet, you still need to sign up for the non-commercial OGL agreement. Still signing something, by the way, and I'm not sure... How I haven't really seen the specifics of the details of that one too much. I focus more on the commercial. Um, but it basically very clearly says, as it, we referenced in that the Gizmodo article, uh, that you're signing your rights away. I mean, technically, if you're putting something out for free on the internet, anybody could take it or use it without crediting you. But now Watsi can do that. Um, and we talked about Kickstarter. So this actually came out from Ryan Dancy, who is one of the original creators of the original OGL from 2000. Uh, and Morris over at NWorld said, I reached out to the architect of the original open gaming license, former VP of Wizards of the Coast and Ryan Dancy, and asked his opinion around the current plan of WotC to deauthorize the current OGL in favor of a new one. He responded as follows. My public opinion is that Hasbro does not have the power to deauthorize a version of the OGL. If that had been a power that we wanted to reserve for Hasbro, we would have enumerated that in the license. I'm on record numerous places in emails and blogs and interviews saying the license could never be revoked. <laughs> People are saying that, but here's the thing. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Maybe once we have the official final document, we will definitely get a lawyer on here to discuss it. Hey, folks, just as I had finished uh, starting to upload the other video... Uh, Noah, a.k.a. my lawyer friend, who is someone I actually got to meet at PAX Unplugged, who is a IP-focused, like, tabletop RPG kind of a lawyer, uh, basically put out an article about the OGL, and I figured this is about as best we're going to get. So let's go ahead and take a look. So it says, my name is Noah Downs, a.k.a. my lawyer friend. I'm a licensed attorney with a focus on business and IP issues, and tabletop and digital gaming industries. This is the kind of person we probably want to have look at this. It says, there's a lot of confusion and misinformation floating around the internet regarding Watsi's open game license version 1.1 and what it means for the future of D&D content creators. So I wanted to take a few minutes to answer some of the common questions I see. So first, let's get some terms and stuff out of the way. Work. A copyrighted work, or for simplicity, work, is an original creation such as a graphic, book, video, song, or program that can be protected by law. Copyright law. Copyright holder is the person who holds the rights to a specific work. This can be the author of the work or whoever received ownership from the author. Open license. Copyright holders can choose to issue an open license to their work if they want others to freely build with, customize, or improve the work. Open licenses give permission to anyone to use this work without costs and minimal restrictions or modifications. Perpetual license. A copyright holder can issue a perpetual license, which is a license to use the work indefinitely. This only means that the license does not have an inherent expiration date. It can still be terminated or revoked. A revocable license can be revoked or uh, a license can be revocable or irrevocable. If a license is irrevocable, then it cannot be revoked by the copyright holder. If the license is revocable, then you guessed it, it can be revoked by the copyright holder. If the license does not say it is irrevocable, it is revocable by default. Third-party creators in this case are individuals or companies that make their own works based on the copyright holder's open license to a work. So what's happening? Watsi has uh, privately released the OGL 1.1, which has now been leaked. It's Watsi's attempt to revoke and replace the open game license 1.0a that has been in place for the la over the uh, two decades. The OGL 1.0 is a perpetual but not irrevocable open license that allows third-party creators to build a thriving tabletop industry that we've all enjoyed from players and publishers and everyone in between. Companies such as Paizo, Alchemy, Cobalt Press, Hitpoint Press, Griffin Saddlebag, DM Dave, Loot Tavern, and many more have sprung up or experienced significant growth because of the terms of OGL 1.0a. OGL 1.1 is not an open license, although Watsi tries to claim that it is. 
It is a severely restricted set of licenses, commercial and non-commercial, that grant Watsi broad rights to the works of third-party creators and requires incredibly high royalty percentages in exchange for continuing to create third-party creators. Uh, sorry, third-party creators who agree to OGL 1.1 grant Watsi the right to reprint, distribute, and otherwise exploit third-party creators' works without any compensation and also require the third-party creators to pay Watsi a royalty if the third-party creator finds enough success with their work. What's followed is a uh, huge industry discussion about OGL 1.1 means for third-party creators, uh, established and fledgling, as well as the tabletop industry as a whole. I'd like to answer a bunch of these questions that have been asked in this discussion, as well as other questions I have received while working with third-party creators. Who does this affect? Why should I care? It affects companies, creators, and fans of like of virtual tabletops, uh, such as Alchemy and Foundry, uh, will be unable to host D&D content and modules at all which will only be available on Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds. Third-party creators, such as Griffin Saddlebags, Luke Tavern, Mage Hand Press, are also subject to these fees, but in addition, risk losing control of the work they make to Watsi. D&D-based Kickstarters will still be subject to royalty that makes them all but uh, unfeasible. All of this serves to chill and limit the growth of the tabletop economy community and limiting the amount of D&D content made by third-party creators for fans and serving as a gatekeeping measure for the industry and the hobby as a whole. I'm a third-party creator. Should I sign OGL 1.1? I cannot tell you whether to accept OGL 1.1 or not, but I can supply you with information to help make your decision. Here's a breakdown of the important points. Any third-party creator that signs OGL 1.1 will be bound by the terms of OGL 1.1 as currently written and subsequently updated. Agreeing to OGL 1.1 means that you'll have to report what your works are making to WOTC, report revenue to works to WOTC if above a 50k, and provide 25% royalties if it's above 750k. You will uh, you will own your own content and works and can distribute them to certain places. However, Watsi will receive a perpetual irrevocable right to use your works and to allow others to use your works without additional payment to you. This would allow Watsi to publish these works in places that you would not be allowed to and to allow others to do the same. Your works are the core of your business. It would generally be a bad idea to give someone else near unlimited access to your business. Wait, 750k sounds like a lot. Doesn't this affect it only a few huge companies? No, not necessarily for several reasons. Well, 750k seems like a large number. That's based on a gross revenue. Gross revenue is the total of all money generated from a work without taking into account any part of the total that has been or will be used for expenses. In many cases, a third-party creator's actual profit will be less than 25% because of expenses for artists, writers, marketing, etc. In addition... Third-party creators have to pay platform fees for distribution, 7% for Kickstarter, 8% for Patreon, 50% for Roll20. Therefore, a 25% royalty on gross revenue can actually cause a third-party creator to lose money, even if they try to make the works in the first place. The 750k amount is the current threshold to impose a royalty. This number can be freely changed by Watsi at any time, simply with an email to you. It is likely that Watsi will rely on the 50k revenue report uh, threshold to determine how much to reduce the 750k threshold by so that they can incrementally increase the number of third-party creators subject to the license. Kickstarters have no cap on revenue you can raise for your product. Uh, so if a Kickstarter uh, so if a if you kickstart a successful campaign, then you can end up accidentally crossing the 750k threshold and suddenly having a new expense you didn't account for when you fulfill your project. It's been over 20 years since the OGL was updated. Why is Watsi doing this now? Hasbro owns Watsi, and December 8th announced to investors that D&D has never been more popular and has, quote, really great fans and engagement. The hobby is under-monetized, a.k.a. Hasbro's not making enough money from it, even though they made nearly a billion dollars in revenue last year. In order to increase the monetization, Watsi can do two things. It can either invest in a team of writers, creatives, and creators to increase the publications and offering Watsi publishes each year, or it can take money from third-party creators by subjecting them to a royalty. The OGL 1.1 takes a foundational document, OGL 1.0a, that creators have relied on for two decades and replaces it with something that Watsi's, uh, that Watsi's monetization of D&D and third-party creators expense. Why not just continue using the OGL 1.0a? Unfortunately, the OGL 1.1 expressly revokes the OGL 1.0a, despite the uh, what this FAQ from Watsi claimed. Um... Can't Wizards of the Coast change this license in any way that I wouldn't like? Yes, it could. However, the license uh, already defines what will happen to the content that's been previously distributed using an earlier version in Section 9. This is from the original OGL. 
I do believe that there are potential legal challenges to revocation of OGL 1.0a, especially given the length of time third-party creators have relied upon OGL 1.0a and the speed with which Wachi has taken action to revoke it. However, these challenges would have to take place in court. So if I'm a third-party creator, I have to agree to OGL 1.1 if I wanted to continue to make license constant using the works WotC is claiming to own? Correct. That is what WotC is saying. And if I don't, I'm at risk of getting sued. Yes, that sucks. You're not wrong. There's got to be something else we can do. Agreed. Several third-party creators are building their own open licenses and system reference documents that will be system agnostic, aka you can use the works they publish with any compatible system, whether it's 5e Monster of the Week or Marvel Multiverse RPG. In addition, you can support third-party creators by telling your fans and fellow players that we need an hashtag open d d to continue to grow this game that we love. And then again, he's got more information here. In conclusion, this is a complex issue that is still unfolding. However, the main things you need to know are the OGL 1.1 is not an open license, and it imposes many restrictions on the use of works Watsi claims to own under relevant copyright law. If you're a third-party creator, the OGL 1.1 gives Watsi a perpetual and irrevocable license to your work so that Watsi can fully exploit uh, and allow others to exploit with additional without additional permission or payment to you. The 750k threshold affects more than just large third-party creators and can be lowered at any time, and you can expect it to lower incrementally as WotC sees to profit off third-party creators. Uh, Wizards of the Coast is a cool company... Uh, is a cool company that publishes one of our favorite pastimes. However, they are not your friends, and if you do not find a way to hashtag open D&D, then it will probably dis diminish the incredible game we have come to love. So, that's a legal perspective on this, and I think that's a pretty good way to go about it, uh, especially, again, from Noah, who is an IP tabletop gaming-specific lawyer. Uh, and that probably, the whole fact that a perpetual license is not irrevocable by nature that is probably the thing that's going to get a lot of people open their eyes and that like yeah they can revoke ogl 1.0a there's nothing saying they can't so anyway once again sorry to be the bearer of bad news but it is what it is thank you all so much for watching and i'll see you next time